Welcome to the American Diversity Report podcast, where we interview innovative change makers and folks who you really ought to know. I'm Deborah Levine, your podcast host, and with me today is Jim Fielding. Jim is president of Archer Gray's Collab Division. He is a respected leader in brand strategy, consumer products and experiences, and storytelling. As author of All Pride, No Ego, he is committed to safe and authentic spaces for all individuals. Having led consumer products groups at the world's largest media companies like Disney, DreamWorks, and 20th Century Fox, Right? (laughs) Jim has built diverse cultures and visionary teams that excelled in competitive global markets. Welcome, Jim. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor. I'm just amazed at all you've done and for whom. How did you get started in all this? Yeah, I mean, you know, I started as a as a retailer. I mean, I started in a department store retail program out of Indiana University, uh, the old Dayton Hudson Department Stores Company, which is based in Minneapolis. And really, the first half of my career, I was a, a retailer. I thought that's what I was going to be, and and I spent some incredible time learning about retail, and including nine years at the Gap. And then I kind of hit the second half of my career when I got recruited in the early 2000s to go to Disney um, and work in the Disney catalog. So I was still doing retail, but I was doing it now in media. And that's where I really started to learn about consumer products, licensing and merchandising. And like probably many people listening and watching the podcast, uh, I had incredible mentor. I had an incredible boss at Disney. I had one, I had two bosses in 12 years at Disney, 11 years with one and one with the second one. And that one that I had for 11 years, Andy Mooney, um, really saw something in me and gave me a lot of amazing opportunities that I'm still grateful for today. Oh, wow. Isn't it amazing how the these angels direct us and yes. and show us where to go so to yeah. be successful for sure oh my goodness and then 20th century fox yeah it was interesting i i never thought i would when i i was at dreamworks and dreamworks got bought by comcast nbc universal and so i was I started a consulting business. I thought I was done in big corporate. I was going to consult and do board work and really do, you know, more work in my nonprofit and my kind of angel investing. And and uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg, the incredible founder of DreamWorks, said to me, you know, I think you should meet Stacey Snyder, who just became the chairman of 20th Century Fox Film Studio. You know, they have a role in consumer products and experiences. And, and, and I... Honestly, Deborah thought, okay, well, this would be a great way to start my consulting business. I I went into the meeting with the intention of consulting and saying, I thought it would look great on my consulting website to say I had 20th Century Fox as a client. And we had one of those, you know, Hollywood famous lunches where it went longer than scheduled and we were really connecting. And I really believed in her vision. And then she told me at the lunch that it wouldn't just be the film studio, it'd also be television. Uh, So Simpsons and Bob's Burgers and FX, and and that made it even more interesting to me. (laughs) But But the biggest thing she did at that lunch was she admitted that they were not, they had never really been successful in the space and they wanted to do things differently. And I kept asking her, like, are you serious about this? Do you want change? Do you want innovation? And she said, yes. And and I said, well, I happen to know that you don't have any senior leadership on that team. Not only is my job open, they had lost basically the next level. And she said, you're absolutely right. And I said, and she said, so what's it going to take for me to get you? And And of course, we talked about money and we talked about benefits. But what I really said to her was, I want the ability to hire the people I know will do good in that job. And I want that to go quickly. I'm not saying that they don't have to go through a process or you don't have to do background checks, but I know who I want in those roles. And I know, and I've worked with these people for a long time and I know what it's going to take 
to create the culture and create the success strategy that you're talking about. And so for the first time in my career, like I announced my job one Friday and the Friday, the week later, I announced five senior vice presidents. And that was like unheard of in the industry. (laughs) And I had worked on it. Like I had worked behind the scenes and I loved that period because we made such a splash on the licensing and merchandising industry because I was pulling people from all the different phases of my career. And it really was a dream team. Um, And we, we were having a heck of a ride and then we got sold to Disney, which was like a full circle corporate takeover. And um, so like the, you know, I was there a little, almost three years, but 18 months of it was managing the acquisition being acquired by Disney. So uh, the beginning was amazing. The end was a little bit rough, but um, it's still, Stacy was a great boss to work for. Dana and Gary, my television bosses were great to work for. And I learned a lot in that job. I learned a lot quickly in that job. It sounds like it was quick. Yeah, yeah it was quick. <laughs> it was quick. Wow. And so now you really specialize in the workplaces that are yes. diverse and headed towards success because of it. Yes. Yeah, my entire philosophy, Deborah, like, um, and I, I don't, I don't necessarily think it that I consciously was like, this is my leadership style. Like, I think my leadership style developed over time, but I really come from a place of authentic leadership. And my belief, and you talked about it in the intro, is if you create safe, productive, respectful work environments where all people feel that they get to bring the best of themselves, their most authentic selves to work, that you will be more successful. First off, you'll create a culture where people want to come to work and want to give you their best. But I also believe that ultimately the the financial, the qualitative and the quantitative results will come from that, that people want to be engaged, they want to be respected and they want to feel safe. And that's all people. But I particularly focus on people from marginalized communities because I'm also in a marginalized community. And so I was by nature, de facto managing diversity without really saying, I'm gonna go out and manage diversity, right? It was, I came at it from, I believe, especially in in a media company and a Hollywood company that our team needed to reflect the consumers that we were serving. And we were consuming, we were serving global consumers. We were conser- we were receiving consumers from all different socioeconomic backgrounds all across the United States. And that I needed a team that reflected that um, in order to be successful, because I felt like if we're marketing products and experience, experiences to these people, it will be more authentic if we do it with people who actually understand those communities and respect mm-hmm. those communities. Yeah. So um, I'm a capitalist. Listen, I worked in the biggest companies. I had to make goals, right? <laughs> I had I had financial numbers, but I, I firmly believe that how you achieve the goal is as important as achieving the goal. And to me, that's where the authentic leadership kicks in. I never wanted to work for a company where it was achieve that goal no matter what. I didn't want to step on anybody's back. I didn't want to take advantage of people. I wanted to do it collaboratively and I wanted to work through the team, not on the team. And I think you understand that. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I, and I was, I was honored, you know, to be in Hollywood for 20 years at those three companies, Disney, DreamWorks and Fox and have people that actually followed me to the different companies because they felt they understood the kind of culture, they understood the vision that I was trying to build. Wow. Um, and so when I look back, I had people that worked with me at, at all three of those companies. Um, and, and that was amazing. Because by the time I got to Fox, it was almost a shorthand of, you know what I mean, when I say this, you know, it's like when we did this before, <laughs> right? It was like this, this because we had to move fast. Fox was definitely, even before the merger, there was a lot to do at Fox. Fox was a fixer upper. And so that meant we had to move fast and we had to make decisions and um, we had to be smart and, you know, read and learn the data and learn about the business. But at the same time, we had to be decisive and move forward. 
Um, and so that was easier with people, even though I hired some people that I hadn't worked with before, but there was that core of people that I had worked with before that made it easier. It sounds like moving fast is your norm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I, you know, listen, people that will, people that know me and love me will tell you, I have two speeds off and on. <laughs> um, and when I'm on, I'm on, but I also know when I have to recharge my batteries and when I need to take a break and uh, practice some self-care and, you know, some, good, good. <laughs> some meditation and some yoga and some, you know, just, you know, I can go so much that I run my batteries down. And I think one of the things that the benefits of age is understanding, I start to know when that's happening and I'm able to calibrate a little bit better now. Good for you. I totally yeah. agree that it gets easier to calibrate it as you get older. Not that I pay attention because I resist. <laughs> you, exactly, you resist. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to admit that your knees and hips might feel a little bit different than they did ten years ago. But right. uh, but you do. I do find myself listening to kind of my body and my soul more than definitely when I was in my 30s and 40s. You know, now that I'm in my late 50s, I think you listen. I'm more attuned, let's just say. Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, tell me, um, there's there was an a element about storytelling in all of this that yeah. I'm curious about. What does that mean for you? Yeah, well, I mean, I realized, and again, I don't think it was like consciously I sat down in my 20s and said, I want to work for storytelling companies, but um I realized, you know, especially as I was writing the book and looking back, that I had worked for some of the world's best brands, you know, in retail and in media. But at the core of all of them, they all had great stories. They were brands with authentic stories and um, both stories about the brand, like in the case of Gap, but also at Disney, like this collection of amazing stories that they had brought together over all the years. And then the story of the Disney brand itself and, you know, Walt Disney and Roy Disney and the entire legacy and heritage of that. And I realized that I grew up in a family of storytellers. We were readers. You know, I write in the book that I think the gift my parents gave me, I think the first gift I remember, I think they put a book in my crib and I am still a voracious reader. And, I love it. and um, <laughs> but we were, we were all readers, like my grandparents and my aunts and uncles and my sister. And we actually talked at dinner about what we were reading. And, you know, some people were into fiction and some people were into murder mysteries and some people were into nonfiction, but we, we were, it's almost like we did a book report at dinner, not formal, but, and I had, two grandfathers, both who were amazing storytellers and, um, you know, bedtime stories and just could enthrall us with, with the stories of they had both been in the war and, you know, things like that. And um, I think I was just blessed with it. You know, my mom would probably call it the gift of gab, but, um, <laughs> but I realized that we all have a story like human, we all have, a, all human beings have a story and we're writing it every day that we wake up and, you know, there's a new chapter or a new page in the story. And I think that also goes back to my ability to build teams and manage diversity, because what I'm intrigued about with people is what is their story and how do I take all these seemingly diverse stories and bring them together for the amount of time that they're with me during work and make it function as a team. Like I'm really intrigued by that. And I love um, it's been one of the best parts about being out on this book tour is meeting people who have read the book who are starting to read the book, who tell me their story. And I remember them like, and, and it, it means a lot to me. And, and I think, um, listen, in the, in the LGBTQ plus community right now, we're under attack. Uh, there's over 500 pieces of anti LGBTQ legislation in the United States and, you know, pending at different levels of government. And to me, we have to go back to telling our stories to write the narrative that is really about us and that we're not we're not demonizing society and we're not trying to recruit new members and we're not like we're we're just trying to live our lives authentically and we want to be respected and we want to have basic essential human rights. And I think we have to go back to sharing our stories in order to do that. Yes, indeed. And you you are a um a definite illustration for yeah. all our readers 
to make sure that their kids start reading really, really, oh, really, really early. Those yeah. Stories. Read to read to them, read with them, and then give them the books to read on their own. Yeah. Um and and ask them about what they're reading. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just know. think mm -hmm. it, it was yeah. such a gift. Oh, absolutely. Gift. And I was I started reading at age three. What yeah. I didn't know was my mother at Harvard Radcliffe yeah. in the 40s had done research on mm. the impact of stories on children and published it in the 1940s. And she Isn't used it on me. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? I think, I think that's, I love that story. Like I, yeah, I, I, I'm so grateful for, to my parents for giving. And it's, it's interesting because my two nieces now, the daughters of my sister are readers and I'm, I'm really happy about that. Well, the storytelling, I call it the science of storytelling, yeah. right? Yeah, you have used amazingly to build these teams and to, to weave them together. Mm -hmm. right? So um, what would you advise managers who are trying to build a, a diverse company, a diverse, diverse team to yeah. do that you know you have experienced well i mean i think it starts with you know doing a self inventory as a manager or a leader and really um owning and acknowledging your story and your vulnerabilities and your tendencies like we all as managers and leaders we all have quirks and we all have you know things that you know positives and negatives we all have development opportunities right so we all have positives and negatives and i think it's you know, I've told a lot of people this throughout my career, it really starts to me in the interview process. When you have a job open, like how you and the people on your team are conducting that interview process, not by violating any laws or getting too personal with people, but just the tone you set, even in the interview process, I think sets the tone for the overall team. Because if you talk about collaboration and you talk about cooperation and you talk about storytelling and you talk about respecting diversity and authenticity and you use words like belonging and inclusivity and authenticity in an interview process, you're setting a tone, you know, even with the interviews ease, even if they don't get the job, they're starting to understand the culture. Yeah. And then, and then I think it, it's really important in orientation and onboarding people, like how you bring people onto the team. And do you assign, I believe in assigning them a mentor and not necessarily from their own function. So say you've hired a new person in finance, assign them a mentor from the marketing department or from the legal department, where they're basically bringing them onto the team as a team member, not as a functional, like they're not teaching them how to do their job because if you've hired them, most likely they have the technical skills to do the job. But again, it's the how they work and it's like how we work and the fact that we have, you know, we have these break times together and, you know, once, once a month we have these organized lunches and, and um, I think it's, indoctrinating them into the culture, not that it's a cult like culture, but just, this is how we work and, and encouraging them to bring their story and their piece to the stew, right. Their piece to the puzzle from day one. Like one of the things I always stress to new people on the team is you don't, you don't have to wait 90 days. Like there's not an orientation period before you're allowed to say, I think this, or you know, I, I think we should do it this way. Or, you know, in my past companies, we did it this way. That might be something interesting for us. Like you don't have to earn your place to talk in a meeting. And yeah. I have been at companies where they do, there almost feels like there's this like rookie period. Right. And, and I've said, no, no, no. I want to hear from you from day one. Um, and honestly, as a leader and manager, I would do a lot of final interviews historically for levels in the company that most other managers probably wouldn't have interviewed for, but because I wanted to have a relationship with that person, even if it meant 10 minutes, that if they did get the job and if they accepted the job, then on day one, when I was walking down the hall, I would recognize them and I'd maybe know a little bit something about them as they've joined the team. Because the, the thing being in LA, you know this based on your background, I believe we're at a war for talent. People choose where they want to work, right? And so 
it's not just about the benefits. It's not just about the pay, or, you know, right. about the job. It's it's the entire package. And and again, you know, my belief is if they feel safe and empowered and respected, they'll bring their best to you. And what would you tell somebody who you're interviewing who is a little bit hesitant, not yeah. sure that they're going to be welcome? Yeah, I would say to them, when I talk about belonging and inclusivity and diversity, it doesn't mean we're all clones of each other. It doesn't mean we're all one, you know, type A's or, you know, I mean, I think that's, to me, that's about belonging and inclusivity is that you have something unique to bring to the table. We wouldn't have you in these interviews if we hadn't identified something unique. That's okay if you're more of an introvert or you're more, you're shy or, you know, maybe you're an extrovert. That's okay because we, because of this process and these multiple interviews we've put you through, <laughs> we've seen something in you and we believe you can be a really important part of the overall puzzle. But it's, a, I also tell people it's a two-way street. We will work with you, but you have to also be honest with us and tell us what your needs are and what we could do better or what we could do differently to make you feel more respected and more I empowered. Love I love you know, it. It's not, it's not just a one way, like I'm going to train you. I'm going to tell you. Um, and I feel like it doesn't matter the size of the team. Every time you hire one new person, the dynamics of that team change. Yeah. And I actually like that. I, I think it keeps you fresh and I think it keeps you, you know, quote on your toes. <laughs> um, and, uh, I, I think that's good. Oh, I absolutely agree. Totally. And and you have a, a saying about control, the controllable. Yes, but, but leave space for the possible. Yeah, tell us about that. Well, I think this is, again, a learning. As I was putting the book together and kind of organizing it around these 10 learnings, I think the first part of my career, the it would have stopped at control the controllable. And, and anybody that worked with me would have said, oh my God, Jim says control the controllable all the time. And that was really about understanding that some of the things in retail and some of the things in media, we can't control. We can't control the weather. You and I were talking about the weather before we started. We can't control the weather. We can't control the global economy. We can't control the mortgage crisis or we can't control government, right? And so there's certain things that happen to your business that are thrust upon you because of things that happen in the macroeconomic world. But knowing what you can control and how you react to those situations, you can control that. But, and I was rewarded, Deborah, you know this for many, many of us in our lives, we're, we're rewarded for being proactive and delivering, you know, under budget and ahead of time and, you know, really controlling, controlling, controlling. And I woke up at one point in my life and I realized that I was controlling every aspect of my life, personal and professional. <laughs> and I had lost spontaneity. I had lost any kinds of happenstance. And that's really where the learning for me and what I'm trying to share with other leaders is, but leave space for the possible. Now, I won't lie. I work on an 80-20. 80% of my life is planned, 80%, you know, but that 20%, I really do try to leave time in my day, in my calendar, in my week, to just be and to just think. And sometimes that means I journal or sometimes that might mean I meditate. Sometimes it might mean I sit on my back porch and drink a cup of coffee. <laughs> um, but what I found is that space, I actually get some of my best creativity and innovation out of because it's like my brain opens, my heart opens a little bit. And, and by the way, if I sit there for an hour and nothing comes of it, I don't consider that wasted time. And at the start, I had to block it in my calendar. Like I had to be anal again and I'd have to put block, right? Or gym time, J-I-M time. And then it becomes a habit, you know, adult learners. Like it became a habit over time where now I just, I do it naturally. Yeah. Um, and if I, if I feel like I'm doing too many meetings back to back, in-person meetings, hybrid meetings, I almost have to force a wedge into there because I can feel myself almost becoming robotic and I don't want to feel like that. I want to, I want to feel present. Oh, I understand completely. <laughs> yeah. I think in the hybrid world, we've had to learn new skills, right? I mean, one of my other learnings is be a lifelong learner and be constantly curious. 
my management style and management skills were really suited for in-person four and a half, five day a week teams. And I've had to learn Zoom and Teams and Google Meet and how to work hybrid and how do you work with some people in an office and some people on the screen and how do you create communication? Like those are new things I've had to learn because of the pandemic. Yes, indeed. Just a a story here. Um, When I was uh, 16, and yeah. back in the 1960s at high school, my mother said to me, you will take this newly offered class in computer programming called Matrix Algebra. And I said, no, I'm going to be a poet, a philosopher. And she said, this is not a suggestion, dear. This is the future. <laughs> she was fascinating. I love your mother. <laughs> Yeah. She and had a so, vision. She had she saw the future. She's right. And I became an IT director in the 1980s and keep on going. Gosh, I am so grateful. And I had no idea at the time how right she was. Yeah. But as we look at the past, both of us, you know, and yeah. we see how we develop and where we need to go. And what needs to happen next. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. So what kind of advice would you give a young person today starting out in the field that you're in? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's that second lesson of the book. I mean, learn, like, just stay intellectually constantly curious, because in media and in retail and consumer experiences that I'm in, it's changing constantly. It's uh, the consumer is changing constantly. The competitive marketplace is changing constantly. Technology is changing constantly. Like every other industry, we're having conversations about AI and chat GPT. And we weren't having those conversations two years ago, even, no. <laughs> um, you know, I work, I work for an independent media company right now. That's basically at a standstill because of the writer's strike and the actor's strike. Mm. And, but we're trying to learn from that situation and we're trying to use this time. Listen, we depend on writers and we depend on actors. And so we want to respect them and we want to learn. uh, They're our partners. And so we want to learn from them and listen to the issues in the strike. But we're also trying to use this time to increase our reading and to look for new stories to tell and to look for uh, new people to work with because the strike will get resolved at some point. And then we will get back to work and we want to be ready when, when the work opens up again. And so that's that. And the other other advice I give to young people, you'll understand this is in your career, don't think that every move you make has to be an upward move with a title change and a, and a uh, uh, compensation change. I, in my career did many ladder, what were called lateral moves or horizontal moves And that was some of the best things I did in my career because I was learning new skills, you know, and I made the big change when I was in retail. I was a field person. I was a district manager on my way to being a regional manager and a zone vice president of stores. Mm -hmm. And I moved over into the buying side and I literally went from an expert level or an advanced level in the field to being a trainee again. (laughs) And that, but that change that I did in my career set me up for things that happened 15 years after I made that change. And so many times when I'm meeting with young people, they have this timeline in their head of like, I have to get promoted to this title and I have to get promoted to that title. And, oh, my friend got promoted at 18 months. I need to get promoted at 18 months. And, you know, that's the other thing is like, look at your own career. Don't compare yourself to others. Look at your own career and look for those opportunities just to continue to learn and grow. And as we know, you're in this for a long time. I'm going into my late, you know, I'm 35 plus years now of doing this, um, you know, almost 30, I guess, 36, 37 now. It's a long career. You're you're in it longer than you were ever in school. Um, and <laughs> yes. don't, and don't, don't feel like you have to accomplish everything in the first five years. You know, don't put that pressure on yourself. Um, it doesn't mean not to be ambitious. It doesn't mean not to be driven. It doesn't mean not to work hard. I love all that. I love all of those skills. It's just take care of yourself too. And just be, be kind to yourself because you're going to be doing this for a long time. (laughs) And this is all in your book, correct? Yes. Yes, for sure. 
Well, um, we're coming to the uh, conclusion sure. of so Tell us where they can get this book and follow more of what you're doing. Yeah. Well, it, it's so, great. I mean, listen, for, for, cause you have podcast listeners and viewers that the, yeah. there's an audible book at audible and at, at Amazon, I recorded the audio audio book also. So it's my voice. You get seven hours of listening to me. Um, <laughs> you, all the, all the bookstores, Barnes and Noble, Amazon target, and any local independent bookstore. I appreciate any support people give to the local independent bookstores. And then I have, you know, website, www.allpridenoego.com, a newsletter you can subscribe to. You can follow me on Instagram and LinkedIn. And uh, I love, it really is me. When you DM me on LinkedIn and DM me on Instagram, it really is me answering back. I love connecting with the community and especially hearing what people think about the book and what they've taken away from it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I always remind listeners, after you've read the book, write reviews. Authors live and die by their reviews. You know this, Deborah. And I'm constantly like, <laughs> I don't care if it's three sentences, just please write a review. Wherever you bought the book, write a review. It helps us. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Audience, you've got your homework for you. Yeah. <laughs> and it's been a pleasure, Jim, to talk with you. Such an I, honor. I, I I think maybe we ought to do a follow-up and say, I love that. So see what you're doing, because uh, you're a, a moving fast. Yeah, I'd love that. I I would be a, a, okay. an extreme honor. Thank you oh, so much. Oh, I love it. Well, thanks again. And thank you, audience, for tuning in. And we'll see you soon. Okay? <laughs> okay. Here we are. Hmm.